How can we emotionally process so much stress and, tra and trauma that's part of this COVID pandemic? We hear of uh, sad stories of nursing staff and care home staff who um, wonder, will I get the, the virus? Will I take it home to my family? Living under such uncertainty. And then of course, if a, a relative does get that, watching them suffer, even being taken into hospital, you can't visit them possibly not even going to the funeral. So these and many other traumas and stresses are coming out of this COVID situation. And a lot of psychologists are predicting that even after this pandemic, there will be an epidemic of post-traumatic stress disorder cases. Now the corollary to that is that in the 9-11 uh, disaster, even though a lot of post-traumatic stress was found, post-traumatic growth was a major feature, more common feature amongst people. That, for instance, they realized the uh, importance of love and the bonds of their family and other things like this. So it was even possible for people to have post-traumatic growth and post-traumatic stress at the same time. So you could say that in all the debris, there were a lot of jewels as well. Now, Jack Rackman, the psychologist who first introduced uh, emotional processing in 1980, said this, Most people successfully process the overwhelming majority of disturbing events that occur in their life. So in other words, the norm is to be able to deal with really highly stressful things that occur in your life. A good illustration of this is when someone close to you dies. At first, the emotional reaction may be overwhelming. You can't sleep, you can't concentrate on anything else. You can't get on with the daily tasks of life. You're crying so much, uh, you want to talk about it a lot. But over time, talking to people, crying a lot, uh, going to the funeral, the wake afterwards, dealing with everything like that, bit by bit, uh, by facing it, the emotional impact subsides until a point may be reached where you can talk about the person, you can watch films of them, and that it won't evoke the same powerful emotions. At that point, you haven't forgotten them, of course, uh, it may take a while, but at that point you could say that you have successfully emotionally processed the uh, trauma. So. In a sense, you could even say that emotional processing is a type of natural healing process. Now, at Bournemouth University, we've been trying to investigate what facilitates successful emotional processing and what are the blockages to this. And a number of very strong factors have come out of the research. Emotional openness is one key thing how open the person is to allowing themselves to feel emotions. Do they realize that emotions are an important part of their life, a valued part of their life, and not an enemy? Do they allow themselves to feel emotions, or do they bottle up or try to suppress and control their emotional feelings? The other side of this, of course, is how much they uh, will express emotions. Talk about them, cry about them, let your feelings uh, out in one way or another. And talking about them is a crucial thing here. Uh, another factor is facing uh, emotions. Facing emotional memories, facing triggers that might set off uh, things, or going to places where it, that are, are difficult. Facing emotional situations, not avoiding. And last of all, uh, what we call emotional connectedness. How connected is a person with their emotional life. Do they value this or do they think this is a sort of an appendage to, to them? Do they realize this is a core part of themselves? So that integration with your own emotions um, is a crucial part as well. You could call that emotional literacy. Emotional processing is like a second immune system, an emotional system devoted not to physical or biological protection, but protection from emotional hurt and trauma. So in a real way, you could say emotional processing is healing 
through feeling.